All right, so hello and welcome to the uh, first ever Pickup Virtual Conference. We're really excited to see so many people here, some of whom we've met before at uh, various uh, Pickup workshops and meetings, and some of whom are new to Pickup. So if you are new to Pickup, um, an extra special welcome for all of you. Um, we have been, uh, for the past five years, running workshops uh, for faculty. And we have a week-long workshop that we've run in previous summers at the University of Wisconsin River Falls, where I'm sure we've met many of you. Um, we've also run workshops at AAPT and APS meetings, workshops at um, universities around the country and for particular departments. Um, there's a lot of activity that's been going on. Um, and our website, uh, which you can uh, see the link up on the upper right corner, gopickup.org, um, has lots of materials, um, exercise uh, sets for integrating computation into the classroom that you might find very useful. Um, if there are any issues uh, as the uh, conference is going along, our contact information is both at the website and listed on this slide. So feel free to reach out to any of the people um, listed on there. I am the first one on the list, Maria Lopez del Puerto, and uh, Danny Caballero, who I think you've also seen on video, um, is co-hosting. Um, Larry, I know I saw on video recently, um, too, and uh, Bobby Kilborn from AAPT, not currently on video, but um, around as well. Um, a few things before we get started. Um, we do have a third session on Wednesday, July 1st and you will receive an email with a different Zoom link for that session. Um, registration has been closed as of right now um, so that we could send everybody the, the um, Zoom link for this session, but it will reopen right after uh, today's conference is done. So if you have colleagues that would like to attend Wednesday's session, um, please uh, feel free to give them um, the information so that they can go ahead and register. Um, the other exciting piece of news that we have is that we will be offering a free online workshop uh, July 14, 15, and 16. And that one is intended for faculty who have never included computational activities to the intro courses. So if that describes you or somebody you know in your department or um, you know, a, a friend of yours, please um, encourage them to register. You can find more information on that under the events tab at uh, gopickup.org. Um, Please post questions to speakers in the chat. And when you do that, make sure that you select um, all panelists and attendees as who your message is going out to, because we would like everybody to be able to see the questions that are being posed. And if somebody poses a question and you think it's a great question that the uh, moderator should bring up, uh, please feel free to amplify it by saying uh, plus one um, and the person's name that posed the question in the chat. Um, or in some other way, just expressing that, you know, you'd really love that question to be answered. Uh, presenters will get a verbal one-minute warning from moderators. Um, so if you're a moderator, uh, please keep time of, of time and make sure that you're giving presenters uh, their warning. And just so that everybody knows, sessions will be recorded. Um, as an attendee, you're not on camera, but um, the chat does get recorded along with the session. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to today's uh, first session and um, moderator, uh, Tor Odin. Alrighty, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Tor Odin. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Computing and Science Education at the University of Oslo in Norway. And uh, as Marie said, I'll be moderating the uh, first session here, uh, session 1A, which is on how to do uh, physics labs online and over distance learning. Um, so I figure we'll just get right into it. Uh, so on the schedule to start is Eric Jensen, who is a physics instructor at Chemeketa Community College. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yep. Uh, in uh, Salem, Oregon. And uh, Eric is going to be presenting on how introductory physics labs can be done by a distance learning through uh, some custom lab kits, IO lab devices, and real-time physics pedagogy. So take it away, Eric. Okay. Um, I need to, uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing here. So I'm not, I'm not able to share my screen. 
Okay. Let me I that. just made that available. I didn't realize it would okay. restrict you. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Eric Jensen. I've been teaching online for about 15 years uh, for introductory uh, college physics at Chemeketa Community College, and I appreciate the uh, invitation to speak today. Um, so, uh, outline of my talk, I'm going to uh, kind of frame the question with the first four uh, items here, and then uh, the bulk of my talk will be about uh, what I do and the, the research that I've done on this. And time permitting, I'll do some unsolicited observations about online physics in general. Um, so why do we do labs? I think that's the, the first question we should ask. And fortunately, that's been answered for us by uh, the AAPT. So they've given us the, uh, the learning outcomes that, um, that they expect for, um, for, uh, for physics. And so I, I think these are things that most of us can, can agree on. Uh, sorry for the giant wall of text, but there it is. Um, so I want you to open up your, uh, your chat and uh, type in which letter you use to measure lab learning. So go ahead and I'll give you a, give you a minute to think about that. So um, do you do any lab specific tests? And um, if so, what is it? Okay, wow, coming in, okay. So I'm trying to synthesize all this data. <laughs> so it looks like a lot of you are are doing some sort of measurement for uh, for lab learning, which I think is fantastic. I think a lot of people don't even uh, don't even try to do uh, do lab learning. So uh, well done to this group. Um, so uh, here's one way to do it. Uh, you can use a standardized exam like the uh, the FMCE, and here is an example question for that. So maybe we're trying to do the same things as we're doing in lecture, trying to develop conceptual understanding. So another, sorry about the quality of this slide. Uh, another way to do it is an attitudinal survey. Uh, the, uh, the E class is another way to, to measure it. Do students become more expert-like in their thinking as they, uh, as they take your class? or take your lab, I should say. And here's a, uh, one that I'm not uh, terribly familiar with, but I think is excellent, is the, uh, the PLIC. So it measures very specific lab learning uh, skills. So um, some important research that's been done. Um, one that uh, may, you may be familiar with is that traditional labs in an introductory physics class uh, did not uh, lead to any learning as measured by exam scores. Um, the, uh, most of the research that's been done regarding uh, development of expert-like attitudes is that traditional labs do not lead to, uh, to any gains. In fact, there's some evidence of harm that they become uh, less expert-like in their thinking. Uh, there has been some research, uh, this is, goes back to the 1990s uh, with real-time physics that you can't, a properly developed uh, lab can learn, uh, can result in conceptual gains such as on exams like the, uh, the FMC. Uh, okay, next question. How do you do online labs? Assume at least some of you have been forced into to doing that. So what's your answer to that question? Okay, looks like a lot of a uh, lot of E. That's uh, interesting, um, and uh, seems like a lot of G. So I'll be curious to see what to see what people are doing with uh, with the the other options. Um, okay, so here's uh, here's an example of uh, one commercial lab kit, the E Science Labs. Uh, they, they, I don't have any experience with this. I'll, I will just editorialize that I'm not terribly impressed with what they have to offer. Um, so I would say that's more a general science lab kit as opposed to a, 
um, to a more substantive uh, majors type of course. Um, so we have multi-purpose sensors like uh, Pocket Lab or the IO Lab. I haven't used the Pocket Lab, but I have used the IO Lab. Um, of course, people have measurement devices already in their pocket. Of course, a phone can be used as a sensor. Uh, people have household items like tape measures and things like that that they can use to supplement their, uh, their labs. Uh, we have uh, video analysis uh, tools such as Tracker. You can drop things and uh, use frame-by-frame -frame analysis to, uh, to do physics experiments. Um, and of course, we can uh, expand our ideas of what labs actually are. We can do simulations. Uh, we can do um, uh, analysis of experiments that others have done. So maybe an instructor-generated video or data. So here's my initial approach was uh, to develop lab kits. We have uh, on the left, we have a Atwood's machine. Um, in the, uh, the middle bottom, uh, that's a Hooke's Law variation with a, with a rubber band. Of course, we use uh, springs as, as well. Uh, on the right is an AC circuit with a resistor and a capacitor, and it can be a variable frequency AC circuit because it's uh, connected. Kind of hard to tell what's going on there, but there's connections to the, uh, the sound card. So we can uh, use Audacity software to, to program in the uh, the frequency and the and even the amplitude, if you want to vary that. So, of course, I have students supplement their work with um, with household items. So, on the on the left is somebody uh, checking for resonance in a tube, and they're using uh, their their own instrument to generate the sounds. Uh, we have a you know student doing a uh, rotational uh, lab, just uh, th rolling things down a ramp, and of course you have the student dropping an anvil and uh, timing it. Okay, so my first research involved uh, testing which characteristics of students were successful. So I did a multivariable regression in order to uh, test uh, what the best predictor of grades was. So this isn't lab specific. I'll get to that in a bit here. But um, what do you think is the most uh, best predictor of their grade. Go for it. Okay, looks like mostly uh, A and B. And my initial uh, thought was that B was correct, but it turns out it's, it's not. Once you take into account GPA, there is actually very little effect. In fact, it's a negative coefficient, which is uh, pretty strange. But GPA has a large coefficient and it has an incredibly tiny p-value. So that's basically the best predictor of success in, uh, in online or campus-based physics, for at least for, uh, for my students. Um, there is a small negative effect for uh, being a Chemeca a community college student as opposed to an outside student coming in and taking my class. Um, and there's a, a small online penalty and there doesn't appear to be any effect uh, for, for gender. Okay, so my next bit of uh, research was to uh, an NSF funded uh, research when, where we combined the IO lab device with real-time physics pedagogy. So the real-time physics was demonstrated to be effective at um, improving scores on the FMCE, but it wasn't designed for use at home. So the IO Lab, a uh, relatively inexpensive device, and we thought we could uh, use that as the basis for, uh, for mechanics experiments to be done at home. We started this in uh, 2015. And so here's some uh, characteristics of uh, real-time physics that you, you may already be familiar with. So the IO lab uh, has multiple sensors. The ones in bold there are the ones that we actually use for the mechanics labs. But as you can see, you could probably use this as a basis for a, for a full year of experiments. So here's a uh, typical uh, prompt before people do an experiment. So uh, this particular experiment would be a 
a uh, student sends the IO lab up and down the ramp. Uh, but before they do that, they're supposed to predict what the velocity as a function of time graph will look like. And then they actually do the experiment. So they'll make several predictions. They'll predict the velocity, acceleration, et cetera. Here's some actual data that was, uh, that was collected. So one key um, uh, thing that students need to do is to focus on the relevant portions of the graph. That's probably the trickiest part here. And so you prompt them, uh, when did you let go of the, uh, of the IO lab? And hopefully they identify it as about uh, 0.9 seconds. And then what's the turnaround point? Uh, when, did you, uh, when did you catch it when it rolled back down? Things like that so that they can focus on uh, this section here as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to these parts where people are uh, pushing it. So uh, once they collect that data, then they're prompted to, uh, to reflect on what uh, was their prediction uh, accurate. And of course, we don't grade them uh, down for having incorrect predictions. We're really looking for uh, correct analysis at the end. Although, of course, students will try to go back and fix their prediction because they always want to be right. Um, so we analyzed our, we, we developed uh, 10 labs and we uh, did a E-class um, pre and post test. So that's again, the attitudes uh, test. Did they become more expert-like in, uh, in their thinking about, um, about physics? So go ahead and um, make your prediction there. How do you think we did? Okay, most of you have uh, some too much faith in me. Um, so we were trying to, to do to improve uh, attitudes. And so of course, the result was that we uh, that we didn't improve their, uh, their attitudes, there was really no uh, measurable effect on on some questions, we uh, seem to have a slight improvement on and then on some questions, we actually demonstrated a, a bit of harm in their uh, attitudes towards uh, towards physics, but it's, I think it's no surprise that something that wasn't designed to improve attitudes uh, didn't actually improve attitudes towards physics or towards experimental physics. Okay, so now let's, uh, what do you think about the uh, FMCE? How did we do on that? Okay, most of you are saying B. Um, and I, I think you can decide for yourself what's, uh, what's right here. Uh, we have, uh, we did a test both at, at my college, Connecticut Community College and at Portland State University. And we did it both on campus and for, uh, for online. This was, um, this data is from 2017. And so we did a control group, uh, students who didn't use the uh, IO lab real-time physics curriculum um, and then there's, uh, we compared that to the, uh, the distance learning in campus. And, you know, of course, 40% normalized gain on the FMC is, isn't uh, anything to brag about. But when, I think once you get up to about 50%, you're, uh, you're, doing, you're doing fine. So I would say a slight improvement at least, um, but not, not perfect. Okay, so here's what I would conclude for online labs. I would not be worried if I were you about doing substantive labs. There are lots of options out there. You can, you can do it. And in my experience of 15 years of teaching online labs, uh, they, the students will do just as well as your campus-based students if you, uh, if you put in the, t the time and effort to develop substantive uh, labs. Uh, a warning though, is that you are unlikely to actually get any uh, learning unless you design them properly. And uh, what my recommendation is, is that, uh, so th this is where I'm going to be working towards is using the IELTS framework and uh, measuring with the, measuring the lab specific skills uh, as opposed to uh, things that are supposed to be done in the lecture. And so <laughs> warnings, I would, uh, for online physics, um, 
you will encounter high dropout rates. I think that that's a, that's a serious issue with, with any online learning. The uh, tech support is a huge problem and uh, cheating is a huge problem. Okay. Um, and that's it. I'm gonna go ahead and just start answering some of these questions that are popping up. Uh, error bars on my graph, no, sorry, we, do, we don't have those. I can give you the, um, the N was uh, anywhere from 30 to 60. So that should give you a, um, a, an idea. Uh, how, did I, how did I do the FMCE online? We had it, we have proctors. And so we sent it out to their proctors. It was a little bit uh, tedious, at least for me. Uh, the online class for Portland State was actually a hybrid class. So they were able to, uh, to they were taking their lecture on campus and they're doing their labs at home. So that wasn't, an, uh, the FMCE was very easy to, uh, to administer to them. But for me, it was all uh, through, through proctors. Um, how did I get the IO lab to the students? We mailed them out. So it was a, um, it was a NSF grant. So we, we uh, just bought a big pile of them. They were $100 at the time. Uh, now I think that the IO lab is more, uh, more for rent than for, for buying, I, I'd have to, to look into that, but I think that's the model that they're going with is rent as opposed to buy. Uh, peer instruction uh, during the online labs, uh, no, that's, and that's an unfortunate part of uh, doing the online labs. They're mostly doing it at home. Um, there could be some peer instruction on the discussion board, uh, but for the most part, those people are working alone. Uh, Real-time physics, you're supposed to use groups of two or three, and so that's a uh, that's a that's something that's less than uh, less than optimal. Um, who pays for it? Uh, the NSF paid for it, at least for uh, for us. Um, can I post links to the tool? Yes. So I'll I'll make my presentation available. Everything that I mentioned, I've um, in the comments is linked to. Uh, was the course fully asynchronous or were there synchronous components? I, at the time that I taught this class, it was, uh, was fully asynchronous. Now I'm, I'm actually integrating some synchro synchronous components uh, because of the students that were, um, because of the students that were forced into online, we, we decided that uh, there should be some, uh, some synchronous uh, elements to it. Um, uh, tips on reducing the amount of cheating. I'm hoping to uh, to learn from from you all on, on how to do that. I I we did or get a subscription to Chegg, and we uh, so I downloaded all of the answers to the homework that I had written. So even though I write some of my own homework problems, those those eventually make their way to Chegg, and so I copy those answers. And if I see the the answers from Chegg, then I uh, then I catch them. Um, oh, do, do I do videos on how to do the lab? Uh, no, but that's something I'm going to, to work on. I'm going to, uh, I, I, I will make videos right, right now. My instructions for my traditional labs are uh, just written instructions with some photos, but I think videos are a good idea. Uh, with the IO lab, they just dive right into the, uh, they just uh, grab their IO lab and, and dive in and they, yeah, there's no uh, how to, they just, they just do it. Um, yeah, trying to get students to, to work together uh, virtually, I, we did not do that just because of the asynchronous nature of the, of the, the labs. Um, Okay, so a question about the uh, Audacity software. Um, so yeah, you just plug it, you just take a set of headphones and rip them apart and then you uh, just basically strip down to the wires and that's, a, uh, that's an AC signal. You just use the uh, Audacity software to generate the, uh, the, you generate a tone in the Audacity software and then instead of hearing it, you're just generating the AC signal with the, uh, with the, uh, with the headphones. 
Okay, so uh, problems with data from dropout rates. Yeah, so obviously any student who doesn't take the pre and post test, both, both the pre and the po post test, they, uh, they aren't included in the, in the data. There's just no way to, uh, to get that. Um, okay, any other questions? I think I'm, I think I'm out of time. All right, well, just let me uh, do, my, do my thanks. Um, so thanks to Jamaica the Community College. Uh, thanks to uh, the, the students who, who, uh, who worked on this, including the, the student programmers. Um, so Eric Bodingham and David Sokoloff, my, uh, my co-PIs on, on the NSF grant. And thanks to Matt Salen, who is actually the inventor of the IO Lab, and thanks to Pickup for inviting me. All right, and thanks for that fantastic presentation, Eric. Um, so we actually do still have a couple more minutes here before okay. the next session Sorry. is due to start. Uh, okay. Uh, but Great. any questions that we don't get to here, um, I'm, I'm compiling a list, so I'll try and synthesize those okay. for the panel discussion later on. Okay. Um, we I... did have one. Uh, how does the capability of IOLab compare with what you can do with phone sensor apps like Firefox or? The, yeah, I'm just, I'm just sensors? not, um, I, I'm not qualified to answer that. I've just been, I've been wary of using phone apps just because of uh, this issue i can get back to to that um let's see where, um the tech support issue because of everybody has a different phone so i'm um, um that that concerns me but i think that using a phone as a sensor is a fantastic idea but i just haven't explored that so i, I can fairly answer that question and then we had another question about uh, peer instruction during online labs. I'm not sure if we. Yeah, that wasn't explicitly that. Uh, done. I, th I think it's a good idea. And I think because um, I am integrating a synchronous component to my, my classes now that we're forcing students into online as opposed to having them volunteer into it. Um, I think it's reasonable to have synchronous components. And so it's reasonable to have uh, to include uh, peer instruction. That's certainly something I that's super important to me in my uh, in my campus-based classes. So I would love to see that integrated in uh, online as well. Great idea. Okay, uh, Ian had a had a question. Um, how do they? How are they guided through the steps? Uh, Ian, would that be? Uh, are you talking about the real-time physics IO lab work? Is that, or are you talking about my uh, more traditional labs? I guess I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. With um, okay, okay, so. Um, Oh, okay. So for the for the traditional labs, I mean, it's just the list of uh, phone or the list of sorry, a uh, list of instructions that they uh, they get. Sort of a uh, it's a traditional lab, so they get a traditional lab handout, just like the campus-based students would get. So just a uh, list of instructions. Yes, they would turn in, and so they they do turn in a, a report at the at the end. And so yeah, very traditional in the sense of here's a list of things to do and turn in a report when you're when you're done. All right, so I think we'll uh, we'll call it there. So let's give a, a digital round of applause to uh, Eric again for a wonderful presentation. And then uh, um, if you have other questions, again, I'm going to be copying them over to the uh, my my little notebook here. So I. Let's see, can you unshare your screen there, Eric? Yeah, sure. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so next up, uh, we're going to be hearing from Martin Connors, who's a professor of physics at Athabasca University in Alberta, Canada. 
Um, and he's going to be building more on this theme of uh, doing labs over distance learning by telling us a little bit about the uh, home lab and folks at his university have been working on. So take it away, Martin. Thank you. I, I seem to have uh, my uh, PowerPoint obscured by sharing the screen. So hold on a second, please. Uh, oh boy, how can things go wrong? Um, okay, maybe this will work. Share. Okay, everybody should now see my presentation, is that correct? Yes, indeed, we see it. Fantastic, okay. So, uh, good morning and uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to give this because I participated in pickup and I'm actually trying to use the computing in a math course, not a physics course. So I'm very glad to see that pickup has picked up the burden, so to speak, and uh, is dealing also with laboratories. Uh, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Athabasca University as a distance education uh, university, primarily in Canada. And uh, for about 25 of those years, uh, we have been doing uh, distance education physics, including labs. However, uh, the first home lab, if you think about it, goes back a lot further than that. And that was uh, Archimedes uh, discovering how to uh, investigate specific density, uh, differentiating between gold and silver, and of course the famous story of him doing it in a bathtub. If you study how ancient Greek society works, running around naked in the streets was maybe not terribly unusual, and this probably was not in a private bathtub, but nevertheless let's consider that to be the first home lab. And uh, it also leads to the question of why do we do labs in a lab. Uh, this for introductory students seems to give a bad impression about physics that it is something that only happens in labs. Whereas in reality, uh, many of the introductory physics principles that we look at occur around you every day in your home. And so there's, I feel, a certain ownership that can be had by actually getting students to do things with common everyday uh, things that happen around them and with everyday materials. So let's, uh, we're now forced to, uh, we're in hot water in a certain sense like Aristotle, uh, Archimedes rather, and so if experiments can't be done in the lab and we're self-isolating, why not do the labs at home? Uh, you'll also have noted uh, my title had a durable lesson, and I think this may, once you've tried it, not be something that you do temporarily. You may try it and never go back. That's my quote. But anyway, you're going to have to try it, so hopefully I have some ideas for you. So, uh, as I mentioned, we've been doing home labs at Athabasca University for about 25 years. Uh, we were offering... Um, physics distance education courses, also starting about 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, we actually had the labs contracted out to a nearby university. So students who did not want to go anywhere, in other words, they wanted to study at home, had to physically come. Some of them came to Northern Alberta from Texas to uh, take our on-site labs. So obviously this was against the very principles that we were trying to work with that students wanted to study at home. So about 25 years ago, I bought all the materials, and I'll show you them in a second, and ran the labs myself instead of contracting them out. And then we just kept the materials and flipped that over to be, well, we'll mail this stuff out to uh, students. However, let's go through these points. In 25 years of experience, we found that doing labs at home works really well. So there's obviously some thought, some approaches needed that I'll share with you in a moment, but it is a really good thing to do. Um, in the early days, we invested quite a lot of money in the home labs. That may no longer be necessary. I'll discuss that. We, in fact, for one of our courses, do not spend any money at all on home labs. Uh, the logistics can be complicated. As physicists, we are not experts in how to send out materials. So keep in mind, your library 
does exactly that. Talk to your library, they're very helpful. Uh, lab manuals have to be rewritten probably if you're going to switch over to this and uh, they have to be appropriate to what's in your labs. That goes without saying. Safety, uh, people have seemingly been concerned about in uh, say no problems in 20 years. I really should say no problems in 25 years. In other words, we have never had a problem with safety. Our chemistry colleagues switched over to using home labs and obviously they need to pay more attention to that sort of thing but we have a disclaimer and after that people just do common sense and it's not an issue. Uh, having students set the labs up themselves instead of a lab instructor setting it up or a lab technician is a good thing. It's very hands-on and generally we've had a custom written report so not a fill in the blanks type of lab report. Okay so let's get down to the nitty-gritties. Um, in 2004 we had sort of a fully developed kit it was based on Texas Instruments calculators, which were relatively expensive. It had uh, added components that attached to the calculator, which was also fairly expensive. It also had some custom made items. And you'll note in a very Canadian way, we had a hockey puck. Um, so uh, by 20, uh, 2008, uh, we had modified so that things attached directly to the computer. Uh, you'll note that we had this sort of a jig that they could do an Atwoods type experiment and a sliding friction experiment. We now do that in another way. Um, and uh, we have a distance education library, so they were used to sending things out, which they did. We now have 800 physics students, and we actually have a section of our lab that is devoted to processing lab kits for all subjects that do it. Uh, so the present kits in our introductory mechanics course don't cost anything. So from the left are some things that students supply on their own. Uh, so we can bounce balls, we can do tape measures. In the center you see a basketball being thrown and video recorded. And then Tracker or Logger Pro uh, is used to analyze that data. There's a, a Hooke's Law experiment. We're fortunately in Canada, we have heavy metallic coins, dollar coins and uh, you can investigate the stretch of a common elastic band. And then an interesting one is the moment of inertia lab, which is done simply by rolling something down a slope and timing it, somewhat similar to the IO lab experiment in the previous uh, experiment, only just done by timing. And uh, we have specialized materials in the optics kit, so that still needs to be sent out. Uh, and um, I note that our courses are asynchronous. So um, how one would handle this and how much materials you need at one time are going to vary between asynchronous and synchronous. Synchronous may be more demanding. Uh, and uh, this is a calculus-based uh, variant of that kit. And in that uh, more advanced course, we also get them to build their own electric motor, which a lot of people like and is fun. So the durable lesson to conclude, home labs have been very successful for us. And you may have to use DE methods now. And even if you go back to classroom, it may still be that you wish to do labs as home labs. So uh, this may also help with institutions that are under financial strain, which many are right now. And maybe flipping homework is a good idea. So get the labs done at home and spend more time with students doing problem solving. Students seem to like home labs. Cheating was mentioned earlier. So you get them to photograph their setup with them in it. That helps a lot with uh, cheating and they're also proud of it. They like doing that. And a final note, um, once we started doing home labs, enrollment soared from eight 25 years ago to now 800 that we can hardly even deal with. I'll end there, thank you. All righty, thank you very much for that presentation, Martin. Um, and we do have uh, just a minute here for a couple of questions. I know there was one from Brett about uh, uh, whether you can do advanced labs, like uh, some of the more advanced DNM labs, cloud chamber, radioactivity, uh, that kind of thing via this, uh, this home kit approach. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, another approach that we tried that may be more suitable to that is so-called remote labs. So the equipment, uh, more advanced equipment like that is run over the internet with the students controlling. And uh, then that would have the more expensive material, <clears throat> pardon me, the 
that you cannot send out would still be under student control. They still run the lab, they have ownership of the data, uh, but uh, not done at home. All right, and I think that's all the time we have for now. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but let's give a uh, digital round of applause to Martin for that. And we can come back to some of these other questions that have been asked uh, during the, uh, the final panel discussion here. Now, I'm not sure if I can unshare my screen. I've had this difficulty before. Can somebody unshare it for me? Uh, there should be a little thing at the top uh, that allows you to unshare. OK, great. So I, I can I, force it. So OK, great. okay. thank you. Yep. Cool. Then uh, next up, we're going to be hearing from Matt Bellis, who's an associate professor of physics at Siena College in uh, Ludenville, New York. He's going to be telling us about their efforts to promote student agency through physics labs, while also uh, combining that with distance learning. And uh, Matt was unable to be here, so he's pre-recorded his presentation, and uh, Danny's going to be playing that for us. So take it away, Matt slash Danny. Okay. Um, I have shared the screen. Do you see a max uh, video of, of Matt the full screen? I just want to make sure. Uh, uh, we see a presentation ish. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like a video. Okay. And I'll start play. I shared the computer sound. So Tor, just let me know if you, if you can't hear anything. Will do. Okay. I'm going to start it now. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to present this work. My name is Matt Bellis. I'm a faculty member at Siena College. Uh, we're an undergraduate-only institution, uh, liberal arts college in upstate New York, just outside of Albany. I'm going to talk about uh, some recent experiences that we had uh, this spring uh, with these remote labs making real measurements work at home. So the problem that a number of us in the department had identified uh, a few years ago was that our physics labs had really become, or maybe even originally had been written, uh, as this very cookie cutter approach. There was a lot of hand holding going on with the students telling them exactly what to do. The labs had evolved into filling out a checklist, uh, make a measurement, read a value off your device, and then enter it into some uh, space on the, the lab write up. Um, and I'm exaggerating a little bit about that, that level of, um, of recipe uh, for the labs, but that's really how a lot of it was. And most everybody agrees this is not the way to do labs. It reduces some of the overhead on the instructor, uh, but at the cost of some pedagogical uh, importance for the students in learning how to make measurements. So back in 2016, uh, we started some very early prototyping of other labs that we were calling open-ended or design-based labs, more hands-on approach. Uh, and this took off a little bit more with this uh, article that was in Physics Today based on a study. It was by uh, Natasha Holmes and Carl Wyman. Uh, they had done this study about the efficacy of these traditional labs. And what they found is that they don't really do a great job reinforcing the lecture material. I'm paraphrasing here, but they said, look, we can do better. And what they found is that whether students took these labs or not, it didn't really help them uh, develop any mastery of the textbook content. And so they advocated a more inquiry-based approach. Uh, we're about three hours from Cornell. I collaborate with uh, some other members of the physics department. Dr. Holmes was gracious enough to sit down with me uh, to discuss their approach at Cornell and some of the things that we were doing at Siena. So we committed in fall of 2019 to do these, uh, our version of these inquiry-based labs and our Gen Phys 1 section with calculus. That's about 60 students across three sections. And based on some early prototyping work that we had done, uh, these labs that we used had much more student agency. Students were allowed to make mistakes. They were allowed to go down tangents, uh, but they had time to correct for them ideally. There was less directions in the labs, particularly as the semester progressed. There was less material that they had to kind of digest. Uh, and they were also asked to make fewer measurements. Um, we also tried to minimize the central nature of some of the data acquisition software and hardware. So there was no real exporting of data files from one um, piece of software to another. It was measurements they could make right in their logbook and then write up in, uh, in Python. 
Some of the labs were spread out over two weeks and many of you would recognize the labs that we did. We used some photo gates to time a falling object. We explored a simple pendulum looking at it for large angles, the dependence on large angles, Hooke's law for different materials. Um, and students used a Google Colab Jupyter notebook uh, for analysis and their write-up. Um, and we started using Jupyter and Python back in 2014, maybe even 2013. Uh, so this was just a natural extension, uh, just moving it to, the, to this cloud environment. Uh, so things went very well in the fall and then the pandemic hit. So spring 2020 uh, is up. This is uh, Gen Phys 2. This is more uh, electricity and magnetism. And we didn't have any inquiry-based labs ready. We were doing our more traditional labs. We planned on this summer uh, uh, kind of reworking some of these labs. Uh, but maybe this presented us an opportunity. Could we run some sort of inquiry-based labs at home, so not in the classroom, really remote, the instructor's not there for the full time? So we saw this as an opportunity to try this out, test it out, and maintain some momentum with this inquiry-based approach. We were inspired in part by the MIT Red Box where students are given like a bunch of tools at the beginning of the term and they use these for their labs. Um, so we said, maybe we can send some stuff home with the students, see what they can do. So we offered students the opportunity to do these uh, inquiry-based labs versus the more traditional labs uh, where there was an instructor recording the data for them. Um, and 12 volunteered, uh, 11 of those participated. So as soon as the pandemic uh, hit, basically we had this discussion. Uh, I volunteered to take this on. I've been thinking about this for a while. We decided to do two labs that would be spread out over two weeks each. So this would uh, take up about five, you know, four to five weeks of the remote learning. Um, I assembled the packets of all the materials. I went on Amazon. I ordered some uh, tape, electrical tape, and batteries, and rubber bands, and hex nuts, and stuff for the things we were trying to do. Um, we offered the students uh, the opportunity. I could send them a packet of the materials. They would get their lab uh, equipment in the mail, or if they had equipment at home, uh, they could use it at home. Uh, so even though I put together a dozen packets, five of the students needed them. So I sent those out within the first week of remote learning. I made some videos to explain it. You can look at the playlist there if, uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, and the two labs we did, the first one was actually more mechanics lab. Uh, it was the idea of using timing, using your ears. So if I set up a pendulum and it swings and hits a wall, um, which strikes first, that pendulum or if I drop something from height H, where H is equal to the length of the pendulum. And it turns out it's not exactly one, it's about 1.3, so a longer pendulum, longer height, gives the students um, a greater difference between those two times. Um, the other one was testing out the strength of an electromagnet. This was an electricity and magnetism section of the, the course. Um, so we had the students make an electromagnet and basically see how strong it is uh, by seeing how many tiny, tiny, tiny little nails they could pick up or if some of the students used pins, sewing pins that they had at home, uh, and look at how many it can pick up as a function of the windings. And the students kept an online logbook uh, and then submitted their analysis just as they had been in the previous term uh, with the Colab notebook. And the results were actually very positive. Uh, we were a bit hesitant. Uh, it's a biased sample. So these were students that opted into this. Uh, we got an article in our school paper about it. Uh, there's Noah there. He's a very enthusiastic student. He's interested in being a physics teacher. Uh, one of the other students uh, said to one of the professors that he's like, I now see physics like all around my house. Uh, which is a great, uh, great thing to hear from a student. Uh, there's a few very uh, other positive quotes from Noah and another student of ours, Alexandra. Uh, you can see Gabby's data there for looking at the number of windings versus the number of nails they picked up. Um, but the, I think they actually had a pretty good time. They were on their own. They got very creative, very inventive with the stuff, which is exactly what we wanted them to do. How do you run these experiments? Uh, it was hard for some of them, harder than others. Some of them had some assistance, uh, some of them did not, um, but they were all like great sports about it. And I think they learned a lot and we learned how to maybe run these labs better. So, so what's next at Siena? Um, if I'm being completely honest, the outlook is a bit unclear for these labs for the next academic year. I'm not teaching Gen Phys in the fall. And right now, there's not a real universal support for this approach, or if I'm going to be very generous, uh, for these particular labs, maybe. Um, 
hopefully we can still get some momentum and we can still get a bit more buy-in from the fall. Uh, some of us are still very passionate about it. So in one form or another, even if it's not this academic year, we hope to keep pushing on this, even if it's just prototyping. I provided a link in the slides if anyone wants to actually look at the labs and if anybody wants to use them, you are more than welcome to. I can give you the original tech if you want. Um, it, having some feedback about other student experiences would be fantastic. Um, I'd be interested in hearing how other people did on this. I plan on looking at all the slides uh, when I have the opportunity. Um, and thanks very much, everybody, for, for listening uh, and listening to this recording. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, thanks goes out to uh, Matt for putting that presentation together for us and Danny for uh, streaming it out to the crowd. Um, we uh, obviously Matt can't really answer any questions, but if this raised questions that uh, relate to some of the other uh, presentations, you are more than welcome to post those in the Q&A or the chat and uh, I will collect those up for the final discussion. All right, but uh, for now, let's move on. So our uh, last presenters uh, are going to be Todd Zimmerman and uh, Marlon Patterson, uh, both of whom are coming to us from the University of Wisconsin Stout. And uh, they're going to be telling us about how they uh, have moved both computational modeling and lab instruction online. So take it away, Todd. All right, I think Marlan's gonna uh, share the slides. Yep, there we go. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Todd Zimmerman, and here with my colleague, Marlan Patterson. We're from the University of Wisconsin Stout in the Department of Chemistry and Physics, and we're here to talk about um, an online uh, course, second semester introductory ENM, which uh, we actually <laughs> uh, just kind of got done teaching a few minutes ago, so <laughs> very timely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when we normally have a face-to-face -face version of this course, such as in the winter, um, first part of last semester, um, it's a five credit physics course and three of those credits are lecture, one lab, and one is what we called a discussion. Um, and different instructors do different things, but because of Todd's uh, deep involvement in pickup and computation in general, um, I got on board and I said, hey, let's do yeah, let's do that as a computational modeling, basically a lab for computational modeling. So they typically would meet for two hours a week to do um, computational modeling with us um, normally. And of course, when everything came to a screeching halt last semester, and we made that transition online, um, we ran into the problems that lab equipment wasn't available for our students. And it turned out that the modeling as we'd done it face-to-face -face didn't uh, work out very well. But uh, one of the things that did work, even though the labs that we were doing were kind of videos and simulations, um, since they had already formed good cohesive lab groups, they decided to keep those lab groups and they still worked together. And that was uh, a positive enough outcome that we decided to keep that in the future. Um, Summer sessions are ones that we've been doing for quite some time, um, many terms, and it's an eight week session um, as opposed to a 15 week normal semester, but we have that fully online and we've been offering that for a while. Um, we do experiments using a lab kit um, and we are able to do some computational modeling online as well. So in the fall, um, our lectures are going to be online. And um, because of this structure where we have a two hour lab and a two hour discussion, um, the way it's gonna work is because of social distancing, our 24 person labs will be split into two labs. Um, one will do the lab during what would be the normal lab time. The other 12 will be meeting during that discussion time, which unfortunately means that our computational modeling activities are now gonna have to be online as well. All right, so you would think that <laughs> putting those activities online would not be too hard. I mean, they're already on a computer, right? 
So in the face-to-face -face class, um, we're using, well, actually we're using Trinket in all cases, but in the face-to-face -face class, typically we give them uh, minimally working code um, that they then uh, make additions to. Um, but in a, tr a transition to online, we've um, changed that activity because it didn't work and are giving them um, working code that they then modify um, and uh, answer questions related to that topic. And the little animation there is showing what their code would look like after they modify it. That's just a capacitor and some electric field values that you can see there. It turns out though that it is kind of a problem getting them to do um, the computational modeling online. They already are very kind of stressed about coding is what they call it. Um, I'm not a coder, I don't wanna do computer programming. Um, when you move things asynchronous um, and remote, it's hard for the students' schedules to line up to work together. Um, syntax errors and simple things that we could normally fix just walking around a room don't get fixed, and so students get really frustrated, more so than normal. So we had to make some uh, adjustments. So one of the big problems with the computational modeling activities is the fact that you as an instructor are not in the room to do that real-time troubleshooting. And so that kind of necessitated a shift from minimally working code to um, fully functional code that they then just modify or maybe add in a single equation. And our questions really focused more on the sense making um, and kind of connecting the concepts to um, the equations and the visualization that they see. And then the asynchronous labs um, are very successful using lab kits. Um, and these kits were actually uh, created by Bruce Sherwood and Ruth Chabay for the uh, Matter Interaction textbook. Um, you can get it at PASCO, as, as you see there. Um, but they also have the list of the parts on their uh, Matter Interaction website, and so you can put the kits together yourself. Um, because of how we sent them out through our uh, textbook rental, service, um, they, it's much easier for them to just purchase the kits and send those out. One thing we did add was just a cheap $10 digital multimeter to the kit, um, and that really allowed us to do a lot more with those. Yeah, um, we could essentially do um, all the lab experiments that we could do in a face-to-face -face lab classroom using this kit, with the exception of um, oscilloscope labs um, and some the optics. Um, optics. Yeah, I was going to say equipotential surfaces. Oh. We have that too. But yeah, for the, otherwise, we can do basically the same labs, which is really kind of exciting. Um, one of the things that was really crucial to the online lab was the lab report. That's, that's the part that's graded. Um, and I've kind of refined this method over many years. Um, I found out that giving them a lab report template with this kind of writing on it um, helps a lot. I give them, you know, they need a title, they need to write an abstract, um, all these different sections, intro, procedure, results, discussion, conclusion, um, and references. And I do give them tips on how to, to put those in there. Um, they also need to have um, data tables and graphs. So I give them these templates that they can use um, it staves off a lot of the errors that I would normally see, like, please put labels on your graphs, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I have a rubric developed so I can grade these labs and uh, we currently use Canvas and they ha I, I have this rubric inputted in there and so they submit their lab reports and I can grade it um, electronically from my cell phone. It's, it's not too bad um, and it works out quite well. And so, with the lab kit and all of these kind of scaffolding bits, um, it, it works really well. And anecdotally, um, so far this summer, um, I'm teaching online and the, the lab reports written by these groups of students that I've done this time are much better than I've ever seen before. Um, and I don't know if it's the dynamic being created by the grouping um, or what but something seems to be working better there with the lab reports I'm seeing. 
even though we've taught this class during the summer for um, a couple of years, uh, shifting uh, mid-semester really kind of gave us a clearer perspective of things that work and don't work. Um, we learned that the group assignments um, where students actually arrange their own meetings outside of class can create some good group dynamics. And the computational modeling activities really need to focus on that sense making um, and simple edits to working code if you're not there to help them with the syntax. And the lab kits have actually allowed us to duplicate many of those face-to-face -face labs. And the lab rubric has provided some crucial structure in the absence of the uh, in-person interactions. Thank you. All right, so a big thank you to Todd and Marlene uh, for that fantastic presentation. Um, we do have a few questions here directed specifically uh, to you two in the Q&A, and I think we can take a minute here to focus on those before we move this to the full-on panel discussion. Um, let's see. So uh, Samuel is asking about the class size with the computational modeling via Trinket v. Python. So our, se our sections are 24 students. Um, yeah, so, and we do not have like LAs or any sort of uh, assistance in the room. It's just us running around troubleshooting during the face-to-face. -face. Okay. And how many sections do you work with typically? Uh, typically two or three sections per instructor. And when Marlene and I are teaching together, we try to sync up and so, um, Usually that's three to four sections between the two of us. Um, right now we're teaching, each teaching a section uh, together this summer. So the sections this summer are only 15 students. I don't yeah. know if <laughs> that's true. pandemic related drop off in <laughs> enrollment or what the deal is, but yeah. Um, and then super quickly before we open it up here, uh, do you two use the Trinket course feature since you're already using Trinket? Yes, I do. And um, I have kind of a, it's not up to date with all of my activities, but um, there is a link to a public trinket that has a lot of the course activities and I will uh, be adding to that. So if you want to go ahead and take a look at that material and make use of it, by all means do. Um, I should point out, we're going to try to post some of this stuff to the faculty commons and it may be at some point as an exercise set. So um, they will hopefully be available there at some point. Yeah, also, the the entire section of eight week summer lab um, instructions um, I'd like to post as well on the pickup site. I'm still kind of tweaking it. Yep. And as I mentioned, if anyone does want a copy of the rubric or the lab report template or anything like that, I'm happy to send that out. That's beautiful. We've got a couple other questions about that. Um, all right, well, with that then, uh, so we've got a little bit less than 15 minutes here to have a bit of discussion. Um, uh, so I, I've been kind of compiling some uh, notes and themes on different questions here. Um, and one sort of recurring question that seems to be coming up over and over is related to this question of group work. So. Uh, I think we can all agree that one of the nice things about labs, the way they're normally run, is that we get students working together and discussing and sort of developing those soft skills of collaboration and that kind of thing. So uh, uh, can we just get a little bit of uh, commentary from the different panelists on sort of your, your thoughts about that? Are there ways to still get some of those benefits with group work, even with these uh, distance learning and asynchronous uh, possibilities. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, so we require the students to set up meetings uh, outside of class with their group mates. Um, we do have Blackboard Collaborate through our LMS, but um, they can use whatever platform they want. Um, one thing I did with a, another course, not with this course, um, uh, the last half of last semester was um, to have synchronous meetings and then uh, have them break out into groups and that worked well um, during the semester. Um, during the summer though, we do wanna give them the, the flexibility to meet when they're not, but they are required to work in groups. Uh, typically we have them in groups of three, um, but 
due to students dropping out, whatnot, it tends to be between two and three students in a group. So Eric and Martin, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I think groups are a great idea and I need to, to try it. I mean, I just use a discussion board. So that's the extent of communication with one another. I think. Could you say a bit more about that? The discussion board, basically you have students working individually, but posting. Right. They, and so they're prompted in the lab instructions. Okay. Here would be a, a good opportunity to share your data or, you know, post your graph here or something like that. Um, I've been pretty quiet on this one because we have totally asynchronous courses with individuals uh, who, by the way, can start monthly. So there's no semesters. There's, uh, it's quite different. So I don't really have too much to say about group work. I'm sorry. One thing that we have used is a website called Campus Wire for discussions and then uh, encourage students to um, form their own little chat channels for their groups. Um, it's similar to Piazza or um, Slack or whatnot. The thing we like about Campus Wire is it actually gives students a reputation score, which we then can then kind of um, translate into a, a grade that helps incentivize them um, talking on the, the chat. Um, I just wanted to mention about assigning groups. Um, that's always a source of uh, stress for me as an instructor, but um, there are, um, there's an auto uh, gener group generation in, in most learning management systems um, that we made use of for the first version of the groups. And then um, about two or three weeks into the term, I did a second version of groups that students signed up for. So they were free to use the groups they had been assigned or they could reform, um, change the groups a little bit. And also that prevented students who were just hanging on from continuing to do so because they had to actively sign up into a group and get permission. Um, to do that. So that also helped with the little trick of the trade, I guess. We don't actually have them evaluate, at least not in this class, uh, each other on their groups or have a, a grade associated with that. That might be something to look at in the future. Um, and we do rely on them for reporting any issues um, because they are, I mean, from what I've seen on campus wire, um, I have not seen any issues, but in terms of face-to-face, -face, how they're treating one another, I don't know. Um, and we kind of re rely on them to let us know if there's been issues, but we haven't heard anything yet. So uh, that actually transitions into the second big uh, point that I wanted to get into. So we've, we've sort of touched uh, uh, on assessment and evaluation um, from a few different angles here, but I just wanted to sort of bring it to the forefront and uh, get a little bit of discussion around that. So. Uh, how do you assess this kind of work? What adjustments need to be made in that sort of assessment given the, the differences between sort of a standard uh, lab and a potentially asynchronous lab? And uh, uh, how, yeah, like, like what, what are your strategies for this? What do the students produce and how do you evaluate it? Uh, I could perhaps jump in on that one, uh, although Todd looks like he's lit up too. Go ahead. Okay, so um, in our setup, an interesting concept we've had that others may consider as they move to distance education, we have had something called a tutor. So there's a one-on-one -on -one assignment of a person who could interact with quite a large number of students, but nevertheless, one student has one tutor, and that tutor also does the marking. So I think an important aspect of labs, I'm not sure if it was on the AAPT list earlier on, but is communication. And so they are to transmit back to that tutor via a written report, what they did, what they observed, and what they concluded. And I think that's a very strong framework for looking at communication as a skill taught by labs. So basically the tutor then marks those um, lab reports based on those basic criteria. So I'll just say for our labs, actually in terms of assessing the labs, Marlan came up with the, the rubric and so she's really the, <laughs> the go-to person here, but um, we use the same uh, evaluation for um, the lab, it's, it's the rubric. Um, 
Now, if this sort of scenario continues in the future, or even with our online courses in the summer, it may behoove us to look at some sort of evaluation of uh, group performance. Um, this is the first, this summer is the first time that we've done the, the groups in the online uh, summer course. And so I think going forward, we'll have to create a little bit better structure, but at the moment we're just uh, trying to get through things. And I really liked Martin's idea of um, having the student, or wait, I forget, I'm sorry, that may not have been you, Martin, <laughs> uh, but having the students photograph themselves with the lab, okay, with their lab set up, um, I think that would help, um, although it complicates it if they're doing it in groups, but um, certainly that's one way to assess their, um, their lab setup and, and ensure that they're not cheating. I also think this is kind of a, a philosophical question. People are asking about how to assess labs um, and why do we even do them? <laughs> I think that's a deeper question. And what I came to for myself was that um, I want students to be able to think critically about experiments. I want students to be able to think about problem solving with physical objects. Um, and that's the primary thing. And so I'm okay with lab reports being the primary assessment, although I would love better assessments. So, um, yeah. And you mentioned something though that we thought about talking about, but we kind of skipped over. Um, the We use a problem solving format, um, similar to what you see in, for example, like the Heller um, context rich problems. Um, but we've actually extended that to using the same structure in our labs and in our computational modeling activities. So the the problem solving strategy where you set up your knowns and unknowns, you set up your equations, you set up your sketch and all of that. Um, we try to um, scaffold that structure into all of our activities so they're seeing it in, in different contexts. People are asking about sharing files um, to the moderators. How is, what's the best way to do that? I've created a Google Drive. I just sent you all the session one folks uh, an email to upload uh, files and resources. And when uh, the conference is over and I cut up the video, I will send out links to the videos and to the Google Drive to everyone. Thank you. Uh, all right. So then we've got a couple more minutes left in the session. Um, one question that I think uh, a lot of folks are focusing on right now, just sort of generally, but which, which definitely touches on this, is how do we reduce student attrition? Uh, there's always this risk with asynchronous situations um, where students might drop off the map and uh, we're, we're not able to really sort of keep an eye on them. So I wanted to toss this question out. Uh, do you have any thoughts or any strategies on, on how to you know, provide that support to students in these different environments. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that a very important part is to connect with the students on an emotional, personal level, and you kind of have to force that in the online environment. Um, you know, in the campus-based classes, you're naturally going to get to know the students as as people, <clears throat> and if it, if the online environment isn't set up where people get to know one another and get to know you, they, they, they feel like it's a very impersonal experience. So I think, yeah, forcing, forcing that interaction uh, somehow is, is super important, making them feel a sense of belonging. I think the group formation is also crucial. Um, so last semester I taught an intro to research course. Um, and one of the things I noticed with that class is they had formed cohesive groups um, early on in the face-to-face -face semester, but when we went online, I had 100% attendance in that, and it was because of the group dynamics, and so I've been trying to figure out ways to create um, social interactions between students online so they can form groups, because, I mean, yes, it's nice for me to make a, an emotional connection with them, but I think it's more powerful for them if they can connect with their peers, and um, trying to an idea I just came across that I think is a really great idea is setting up some sort of informal social discussion board or session or whatever so students can talk about stuff outside of class because that's really how they connect with one another. It's the, the chit chat before class starts or in the middle of things and so get them to connect to one another. I, my theory is that that will help with retention but I haven't figured out how to do it online yet. 
All right, and I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. So uh, let's give a, uh, a final thank you to our presenters, Eric, Martin, Todd, and Marlan. Um, and I am going to hand off the uh, yeah uh, digital round of applause here. <laughs>